In this video, we're going to be looking at the process of digestion. So digestion is the process of breaking down food. And why is it necessary that we break down our food? So many of the molecules in food are too large to be absorbed directly into cells. So they must be broken down into smaller molecules. So that's one of the reasons. And the other reason is that the food we eat was made by another organism. So it's not suitable for human tissues. So we take in the substance and then we need to break it down so we can reassemble it in a form that works with our body. So now the question, do all organisms digest? So autotrophs, which we know make their own food using inorganic materials, they don't have to carry out digestion because they're directly making their own food from inorganic materials. They don't have to eat, therefore they don't have to digest. So examples of this being plants and algae. Whereas heterotrophs have to carry out digestion because they're depending on organic molecules that were first manufactured by autotrophs. So they need to break it down to reuse it in a way that works for their body. So we're gonna focus on heterotrophs. So how do they obtain food? So there are four main ways. So the first is filter feeding, then substrate feeding, fluid feeding, and bulk feeding. So we're gonna look at each of those ways. So filter feeding is when suspended matter and food particles are filtered from the water in the organism's surroundings, typically by passing the water over a specialized structure. So basically the water goes through essentially a filter within the organism and suspended food is captured. Examples of organisms that feed in this way are whales, clams, and water birds. The next type is substrate feeding. So this is where the organism lives on or right in their food source and eats their way through it. So examples of organisms that feed in this way are caterpillars and earthworms. The next method is fluid feeding. So this is when the nutrients are obtained by sucking out the juices of other plants and animals. So examples of organisms that feed in this way are mosquitoes, leeches, tapeworms, and hummingbirds. And so they're sucking out either juices of animals or plants. And finally, bulk feeding, which is what we do. Food is obtained by eating pieces of other organisms or swallowing them whole. So examples of organisms that feed in this way are humans, elephants, and snakes, and there are many others. Okay, so those are the different ways that heterotrophs can get the food into their body. And so now the food needs to be processed. And the processing of the food occurs in four stages. So first, ingestion, so actually getting the food in, then digestion, then absorption, and then finally, elimination. So there are those four stages in food processing. So stage one, ingestion. So this is simply the process of taking food into the body. So for humans, this is putting the food in our mouth and starting the process. Next we come to digestion, which is sort of the main big part of food processing. So digestion is the breaking down of food into molecules that are small enough for the body to absorb. So the digestion might occur within the cells of the organism, and this is called intracellular digestion, or it might occur outside the cells of the organism, and this is extracellular digestion. So if we look first at intracellular digestion, so this is what's done by single-celled organisms. So it's a single cell, so it has to digest within the cell. So the single cell organism is going to engulf the food particle by phagocytosis, right? So that's basically the membrane folds around the food particle and brings it into the cell. 
The food particles are enclosed in a vacuole into which digestive enzymes are added from the lysosome. So the lysosome fuses with the vacuole and releases the digestive enzymes. The vacuole then moves through the cytoplasm and it's going to shrink as water and other products leave the vacuole. And then when it gets to the membrane, it's going to fuse with the membrane and expel anything that couldn't be digested. Okay, so this is digestion within a cell. Uh, but what humans do in most organisms is extracellular digestion. So if you're going to do extracellular digestion, you need a digestive system with a tube-like arrangement. So it may be an open tube arrangement where there's an intake at one end and then an outlet at the other. Okay, so in the diagram, it shows that for an earthworm. Or it may be a closed tube arrangement where there's just one single opening, which is where the food comes in and the waste goes out. So um, more pleasantly, we have what is called an open tube arrangement. Okay, so let's continue to talk about digestion. So extracellular digestion within a digestive system typically occurs in two phases. So first is mechanical digestion. So mechanical breakdown of the food into smaller pieces. So this includes chewing, as well as the breaking up of food by the muscular contractions of the digestive tube. And then the other part of digestion is chemical digestion. So we're gonna look more closely at that. So chemical digestion is carried out by enzymes. And enzymes are specialized proteins that act as biological catalysts. So a catalyst is something that speeds up a chemical reaction. So enzymes are the things that do this in biology. In living things, enzymes speed up chemical reactions. So the digestion of food would happen naturally at body temperature, but it'd go really slow, right? So the enzymes need to speed up the process so it doesn't take like a month to process some food that you eat. Okay, so an enzyme works by the substrate, that's the thing it's acting on, binding to the active site of the enzyme, then the enzyme does whatever it's going to do to create the products. So in the diagram, it shows something being, being taken in by the enzyme and broken apart, which is what is happening in digestion. So enzymes are going to break down the large organic molecules found in food using hydrolysis reactions. So a hydrolysis reaction is where water is used to break the chemical bond. So there are four categories of biological macromolecules that are found in food and are broken down during digestion. So we have carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. So we're going to talk a little bit about these biological macromolecules. So they're macromolecules because they're large molecules. So they're made up of smaller subunits, which are generally referred to as monomers. And these monomers combine to form long chains called polymers. So here's a bunch of happy face monomers. And if they combine into a chain, it is now called a polymer. So if we look at each of the four macromolecules and look at what their monomer is and what their polymer looks like. So carbohydrates are compounds that contain only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Their monomers are called monosaccharides. So examples of monosaccharides, so you've probably heard of glucose, other ones are galactose and fructose. So those are all monosaccharides. When two monosaccharides join together, we get a disaccharide. So two of them come together to make a disaccharide. So examples are maltose, 
which is when two glucoses are joined together, lactose, which is a glucose and a galactose, and sucrose, which is a glucose and a fructose. And then if you have many monosaccharides joining together, you get a polysaccharide. Right? So a bunch of monosaccharides all joined together into a line. There might be branching, but it's all joined together to make a polysaccharide. So some examples of polysaccharides are starch. Right? So starch is the form of carbohydrates that's stored in plants. Glycogen is how we store carbohydrates in our muscles. And cellulose is the polysaccharide that makes up the cell wall of plants. And all of those polysaccharides are made up of glucose, just connected in different ways. So next, if we move on to proteins, so proteins are composed of long chains of amino acids. So the monomer for a protein is an amino acid. A linear chain of amino acids joined together is called a polypeptide. And then a polypeptide actually has to fold into a specific structure in order to actually be a functional protein. Right? So you've got various amino acids joined together to make a polypeptide which then folds in amongst itself to make the functional protein. Lipids. So lipids are a pretty diverse group of macromolecules. They don't all have the same structure, but they are all hydrophobic, which means they're afraid, I mean, a phobia of water. Um, they just don't like it. They don't mix well with water. And there are three subcategories of lipids. So the first are the triglycerides, which are also known as the fats. So these are really the ones that we mostly get in our diets. Phospholipids make up cell membranes. And sterols are part of the cell membrane and they make up hormones. So cholesterol is an example of a sterol. Uh, testosterone is an example of a hormone that is a lipid-based uh, hormone. So we're going to focus on the fats because those are the ones that we uh, eat for the most part. So triglycerides are made of three fatty acids and one glycerol. So the monomers in this case are the fatty acids and the glycerol, and they join together to make what's called a triglyceride. So these long chains are the fatty acids, and this end is the glycerol. And then the last one are the nucleic acids, right, like DNA, RNA. So nucleic acids are composed of monomers called nucleotides. And each nucleotide is composed of a phosphate group, a pentose sugar, and a nitrogenous base. And as you continue your studies in biology, you'll get more familiar with this structure. There is a phosphate group, a pentose sugar, right, so this would be like a carbohydrate, but it only has five carbons, unlike glucose, which has six, and then a nitrogenous base. So those things then link together to make the chains that we know of as DNA or RNA. Okay, so those are all the macromolecules that need to be digested by our digestive system, broken down into smaller pieces. So once that has happened, then the products of that digestion can be taken up or absorbed by the cells that line the digestive tract. And those nutrients then travel in the blood to the body cells where they become part of the tissues of the body. So that we say that they are assimilated. They become part of our body. So we have absorption and then assimilation. And then finally, the last step of digestion is elimination. So this is the passing of undigested material out of the digestive tract. Okay, so that is sort of an overview of the process from the first taking in 
of food and the various ways that that can happen. And then the processes that occur through the digestive tract. And then in our next lessons, we'll look at these processes a little bit more closely.